It's time. It's time. I love you. It's time for Dr. Dave and Herman, and we're covering the doctrine of demons. But I want you to see something before we get into this. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. David was invited to the White House. No. No. I wouldn't be invited there, I don't think. See, I'm but. trying to get you in there. <laughs> <laughs> invited to the House of Representatives yes. to serve as the chaplain for the day. Now, you've, been, you've had the privilege of doing this at other times. Yes, I've, I was the chaplain for the House back in 2001 and then for the Senate in 2004. And you were actually being considered as the chaplain. I was about like, that, I was that close. Like the paid yeah. chaplain. I was waiting for the call from Speaker Boehner and told the call was coming, so I was waiting, and then some things took place, and another another man was appointed uh, just before they called me, evidently. But I got to meet the man, so. He's a father. He, he's a Catholic priest yeah. and uh, a devoted servant, you know, to the, you, you like the Catholic him? Church. A nice guy, yeah. yeah. I, it was a long conversation, but he certainly had some bold statements about God and the Bible and Christianity in our little meeting wow. and what he thought should be done before Congress. So, Take a look at this. Baptist Church in Sarasota, Florida. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise for your protection of and blessings on our nation. We thank you for your mercy, grace, and forgiveness of our national transgressions, and we trust you to lead us into righteousness. We ask you to enable the men and women of the House of Representatives to faithfully carry out their duties and the purposes of your will. Empower them with wisdom, courage, and compassion. Grant them the character to withstand the temptations of power and privilege, and bring them wise counselors and friends to help them do what is right. Give them wisdom and make them true statements. We ask you to bless their families and shelter them from the political fallout of unpopular decisions and fill their homes with love, hope, and faith. Restore our nation's historic faith that we might pray, God bless America with integrity. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Wow. It was an exciting day. And, and uh, you said that, that word, Jesus Christ. Christ. Well, you know, there was, there was no way I was going to go pray before Congress without praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, although that is strongly suggested that we, we do not. We just simply pray to God or the Creator. And uh, the last two times I went, it was stated in a letter to, at, if possible, avoid those kind of sectarian phrases. But, you know, I, I, I'm there to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So after I got done, when I walked over to the side, the congressman from Georgia, um, Paul Brown, came walking over real quick before the speaker started speaking and said, Pastor Anderson, thank you so much for praying in the name of the Lord Jesus. We rarely, and this is what was said, we rarely hear that here. And then he said, thank you for praying for forgiveness for our national transgressions, which I believe, he then said, is the slaughtering of 3,300 babies a day in America, and God, may God forgive us. And so I told him that I agreed 100%. He said, but we don't hear that here either. And, I, you know, this is sad. The place where since our founding, yeah. Congress has always opened in prayer. And until recent times, it's always been in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always been with a Christian sense of morality and principle to it. But now it's, it's, um, it's, too, it's too divisive to be that specific when, when you pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But could, I that, could there be something why you were not because you were close to being chosen as the chaplain of the Senate. Yeah. Because of your strong faith? Oh, no, I don't think so. I, I think it was, it was another uh, political consideration. That, that's a political appointment that the speaker is allowed to make. Speaker Maynard appoints. Yes. Uh, whenever a uh, chaplain resigns, whoever is speaker at that moment is allowed to appoint. And there's no rules he has to follow. He can appoint anybody he wants as the chaplain. Uh, and usually they rotate. Uh, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Catholic, Protestant. They try to make it fair. Well, the last one was a Catholic priest. And so the assumption was it wouldn't be a Catholic priest this time. 
but some things happened right before the appointment where it had to be a Catholic priest for political reasons, and that's probably why it didn't Great happen. picture of you guys, because uh, they presented you with a, a, a great uh, uh, copy and certificate. There's, there's yeah. really, and that's the chaplain. That's the chaplain that's on the, the left of the screen, and that's Speaker Banner, Banner next to me, and that's Congressman Vern Buchanan from our district, uh, who, after I prayed, got up and spoke to the Congress. It's in the congressional record now, where he talked about myself and, and our church for a full minute. And in the speech, he said that I'm beloved in my community. Now, my community would be surprised to hear that. But <laughs> it's, it's now in the congressional it's, record. It's I'm there. beloved in my community. And that so. won't come out, right? No, it's permanent. It's in there. It's in the National Archives now. <laughs> okay, now, did you, did you feel demonic oppression when you walked in that chamber? No, but there was a certain sense of protocol. And it was a lot like the soup Nazi from Seinfeld. Uh -huh. You had to keep... Because your prayer had to be written out. It had to be approved four or five weeks earlier. And you were to stand there at that chair. When he says your name, you take two steps to the left, step up to the pulpit. Do not say, let us pray. Just start your prayer, read it word for word, and then move to the side. <laughs> so it's a very structured, time-oriented structure because everything has to be recorded word for word in the congressional record. Well, they don't want to have to be readjusting, re-editing the prayer because you changed it in some way. So it's a, it was a very structured environment. But that desk, what was so imposing was, I've been there three times now. No one is allowed ever behind that except for the President of the United States and the chaplain. Nobody ever stands behind that desk. That's, Seriously? That's where the President gives his State of the Union address. Only the President and the chaplains are ever allowed to be right there. That's awesome. Not even the Speaker of the House can be there. The Speaker of the House is behind. Only the president and the chaplain is at that little sacred desk, they consider it. So it was a great honor, and you have this sense of history that every president has had their hands on this pulpit. Uh, it, it, it's quite profound. Oh my goodness. So how do we transition to Doctrine of Demons? By referring to Rick Santorum. <laughs> because he made news just recently about his comment that Satan was targeting America, and everybody just went bananas that that was uh, some kind of archaic, bigoted, uh, um, unintellectual statement to make that who could say that and run for president, that Satan is targeting America. But there's a reason why he said it. Theologically, it's a perfectly accurate statement. He's correct. Because Satan has always been involved right. in the affairs of man, just like God has been. You know, we want to say that God is in control or he's trying to help us. Well, God is blessing us and helping us and in intervening as the Founding Fathers believed because Satan is trying to interfere all the time. So Santorum's statement was theologically correct, historically accurate. It was even a very American statement, but he was vilified for it. Okay, why? Uh, because uh, our culture doesn't want conservative Christianity to be part of our culture's decisions of right and wrong. Because we're moving secular. We're completely secular. Well, secular and more spiritist all the time. We, we're moving secular, but we're also embracing other forms of religion, uh, whether it's Islam or New Age mysticism. We're embracing those, and anything is acceptable except for Christianity. Amazing. So that prayer sort of fits into that, I think. Dave, you want to bring up some of the things we're going to be discussing in this part, too. Uh, Dave, you want to read some of those? Um, demons inflict disease, and that's, those are scriptural references of when they were able to do that. Uh, in scripture. Demon, uh, demons influence the mind, the way that we think, the way that we uh, ponder and um, uh, interpret information, and demons deceive people. All those are biblical truths that aren't only Old Testament and New Testament, they are modern day. So demons can inflict disease, but all disease is not demonic. Demons can influence the mind, but not all perverted, um, incorrect philosophies are simply the result of demons. It is the flesh, the human nature is totally depraved. We can come up with evil stuff all on our own. And the last phrase uh, was demons. I forgot what it said there. But uh, um, demons can influence people, affect people, afflict people, possess people. All those are biblical terms. And there's affliction, there's oppression, and there's possession, and there's infestation, which what many people believe demons can indwell a house or demons will live in a graveyard, or there's, uh, there's um, areas de designated towards the worship of Satan that have spirits in them. That's infestation. 
and then there's familiarization where demons are actively interacting with somebody but they haven't been possessed. Those would all be uh, biblical concepts. And to what degree they are present today is certainly debatable, but there's no reason to think they are not present today. Okay, let's, some of the topics there, let, let's get into uh, demon possession and that kind of genre. Well, one of the most um, um, popular comments, uh, statements, story, excuse me, is in Luke chapter 8, the maniac of Gadara. But in, before I read it, um, demonic possession has some indications from Scripture we know. From experiences that people have had, we've drawn others that we've added to that list. But the, it's prevalent. It is not something you wonder, is that demon possession or not? It is so evident and so clear that there's another entity causing this behavior. Can you feel that as a, as a, as a believer? Can you feel the presence of demonic spirits in an individual? I'm not sure. Until it's manifested, I'm not sure that you can. Because demons hide. The, the person demon-possessed isn't necessarily demon-possessed all the time in their behavior. They can, they can, it can be repressed and hidden, but it comes out with a certain stimulus. It seems that often the stimulus is the preaching of the gospel, the singing of gospel songs, or the presence of Christian imagery seems to cause a reaction from the demon. Now, in the Bible, in the Maniac, Maniac of Gadara story in Luke chapter 8, Jesus' presence, the demons come running out of the cemetery, those two men, uh, that, and they, when they get to Jesus, they start screaming out, Jesus, what have you to do with us? Don't torment us. The, his mere presence causes a, an emotional, guttural reaction from the demons that appears to be the same thing what happens when, when they are around the preaching of the gospel and the proclamation of the blood of Christ and Jesus. They, they seem to react if our, our experiences are accurate. And those demons did not want to leave that body. No, and there was, uh, there was over 6,000 of them in there. It was called, his name was Legion, and a, a Roman legion was 6,000. And we interpret his name as being an indication he was the leader of some 6,000 demons inside this person. And in Luke chapter 8, the story of that demon-possessed man is that he is antisocial, he is violent, he is self-destructive, sitting out in the, in the night and carving himself with stone. And breaking cut, chains. His, and he's supernaturally powerful. He, they couldn't bind him. He wanted to live in the cemetery. He lived out there amongst the graves because of their fascination with death and, um, and violently hostile towards people. And now that was an extreme case because of maybe the 6,000 demons living within him. But he was released with a rebuke from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we talked a bit, yeah, last week about um, demons being powerful but not omnipotent, um, and very intelligent but not omniscient, that they have, from our viewpoint, they are supernatural creatures. Uh, we don't ever, rarely ever get to see them. I've never seen one. I never really want to see one. But they are veiled from us. We, they're in another dimension. We cannot see them. But if we could, we would fall on our faces before them as being their awe-inspiring creatures but they pale in comparison to the infinite nature of God. When Jesus walks in the room, they're the ones who shriek out in terror because they are minimized by the magnificence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard the expression, we're here tonight to stomp the devil. Can you stomp the devil? No. The Bible doesn't say that we can. The Bible says we can rebuke the devil in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the, in the book of Jude, when Michael um, rebukes the devil, it says when they were arguing over Moses' body, the, the book says, um, Michael would not bring an accusation against the devil, but rebuked him in the name of the Lord. If Michael has to show, the archangel Michael, Is that respect? has to show some level of respect for the power and authority of Satan, so should we. We should, we should respect his power and his evil nature, but that doesn't mean respect it with the same kind of awe and respect we have for God means to acknowledge it for what it is. It's greater than us. Satan is greater than us, but he's not greater than the one that is in us, who is the Lord Jesus. So, okay, explain. Uh, we hear that, and it just kind of drifts off into the air. What is the core meaning of that? That we don't have anything to fear in the presence of the entity who can damage our body but cannot touch our soul, which is what Jesus said. Don't fear the one who can destroy the body because the body is going to be destroyed anyway. It's, it's temporary. 
He can't touch your soul. Our soul is secured and anchored and guarded and sealed by God Himself when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't have to fear Satan, but we don't attack him in the power of our flesh. We don't assault him through our own mechanisms. We resist him and rebuke him in the name of the Lord. Okay, is it demonic for Christians or non-Christians to be drawn into pornography, stealing, uh, lying, deception, all, all of these things that we, you know, even the Bible talks about them, that we would immediately say that's sin. Is that demonic drawing us into that? Or is it is just we're giving ourselves over to this impulse that I have? Well, James says when we, are, when we sin, we are drawn away of our own lusts and we are enticed. And then when that sin has been conceived, it brings forth death. It's our own responsibility. Oh, so, does that have anything to do with demons? Uh, in terms of influencing, providing opportunities, and manipulating the situation that we might succumb, yes. In that way, yes. But we are always responsible for our behavior. And when we commit sin, we can't say, well, the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make us do anything. It is our own volition and will. Unless that spiritual, supernatural thing has happened called demon possession. That doesn't happen to a believer. We've already been possessed. We've been bought with a price. I can't be repurchased by Satan. But a non-believer can be possessed and their behavior can be completely outside of their control to the point that they don't even remember doing what they did, which would be what a, a demon-possessed person would do. Now in Luke chapter 8, when Jesus cast the demon out of this maniac, well, they remember they went into a bunch of swine and the swine ran down the hill and they drowned themselves in the lake. Let me ask you, why would they want to go into an animal? What, what's with that? I mean, well, are we to assume that, that they love pork? You know, <laughs> or hate pork because they drove yeah, them into the yeah. water. No, I but think, did they know that was going to happen? I, I think they, they knew the animals would react violently to their presence inside them, but their al alternative was Jesus was going to cast them into the bottomless pit ahead of time. That's what their fear was. They said, don't torment us before it's time. See, the devils know their day is coming, that there's going to be a day when they will be cast into the bottomless pit, then that bottomless pit will be emptied into the, into the lake of fire. They know that just as well as Satan knows it. They're fighting that. Well, when Jesus came all of a sudden, way ahead of time, they said, don't do it to us yet. Let us go into the swine thinking they might be able to somehow escape the situation if they could go into the swine first. So the Lord let them do it. And an uh, demons seem to possess living things, not inanimate objects. But that's all the Bible tells us there. It doesn't give us a thesis yeah. because if it did, we'd be so fascinated by demons, we'd be spending our time studying demons rather than studying God. We talk about the supernatural power of demons rather than the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. So all he, he just gives us glimpses yeah, yeah. that here's the reality, but don't be aware of it. Be aware of God and His power because that's where your real source of strength is. In uh, Demons Inflict Disease, Luke 13, 11, testifies about a woman that had a crippling sickness. Yes. Okay, so demons do put disease on us? There can be deafness, dumbness, blindness, paralysis, diseases, physical diseases from demonic presence in someone's life. According to the New Testament, yes, that's true. That doesn't mean all diseases are demonic uh, presence. That doesn't mean you can't go around casting out the spirit of cancer every time somebody has cancer, or you can't heal blindness by casting out the spirit of blindness. But there are instances in which the physical malady is only because there is a demon present. And that would take the the discernment of the Holy Spirit to know when that may or may not be true. But in, the, in, in Jesus' presence, uh, in, his, in His ministry in the New Testament, that was prominent. But I think it was because the church was engaging the pagan world right on the ground level. It was reaching out into the Gentile pagan Greek culture and the Roman Greek pagan culture with the gospel. And that was new because the faith had always been sequestered. Now the faith of God was in being injected into the pagan world and it was interacting with demonic presence. Okay, where did that casting out the spirit of cancer, casting out the spirit of lack, which, you know, you don't have any money, where did all that 
begin? What, what is that? Because well, you I, hear it all the time. Again, this is my attention and my, my opinion, but I believe it's a well-intended misunderstanding and misapplication of demonic activity in the New Testament, trying to explain away and give hope to people who are suffering that there is a cure, there is a remedy, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the remedy applies to right now. And that understanding uh, then looks for venues to, to uh, be applied when it's not necessarily always true. The, the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ primarily and predominantly is the spirit, the soul, the cleansing from sin and the imparting of the Holy Spirit for the gift of eternal life because we're all going to die from the disease of age. Aging is a disease. Right. So we're all going to die from that. No one has ever been cured of that yet. Everybody has died from old age at some point in time if they haven't died earlier. The Lord's main concern is our spirit and our soul because the body will decay. It's going to return to dust. He's going to give us new bodies. But there are instances in which the gospel can be preached because of a healing. Because somebody is miraculously healed, it gives a platform yeah. for the proclamation of the gospel. Yeah. And that seems to be the New Testament format, which is why the, uh, in the Philippian jailer story, the demon-possessed girl who's walking around saying, this is Paul, is a servant of the Most High God. And Paul rebukes the demon out of her, but she was a fortune teller. And she was making a lot of money for her masters. So they then revolted and had Paul arrested. He's thrown in jail. And then he bust out of jail, and that's the story of the Philippian jailer getting saved. It all started with a demon possession and her being healed by the proclamation of Paul in the name of the Lord Jesus. But it planted a church. It wasn't just for the sake of relieving suffering. How did we get to the idea that God in certain denominations heals? And like in the denomination you're in, it's rare. Where did that begin? Well, wh whatever we think it is, God's healing is the same everywhere. So with, if one denomination understands it or perceives it differently than another denomination might do, it doesn't mean that God's not doing it. So I'll uh, say what I, I'm an um, independent Baptist, an evangelical Baptist, you know, leaning towards some Reformed theologies. I might be a Reformed evangelical Baptist, so who knows what I am. But in, in my theological camp, God heals, and He heals miraculously, and He heals through prayer, but He does not heal through an uh, a individual who walks around and touches people and just heals them. As so, a, so as in a other words, if, you're not prone to have a line of healing coming up and, and, and touching them, and all of a sudden they walk out and go, oh, I've been healed of whatever. Whereas the other denominations, that's just common for them that, to have a line yes. of healing. And it's because of that. And it's because of that that they get the idea that you don't believe in healing, yes, but they believe in healing. Yes, and it's not true. I, I certainly do believe in healing, but I, I believe God's primary focus is salvation. Jesus Christ didn't die that we might not have cancer. He died that we might be freed from our sin. But there are physical blessings to the presence of the Holy Spirit and the God's plan for our life. For instance, here's a great example, um, Francis Schaeffer, one of the greatest Christian minds of the last generation, maybe the last hundred years. He got cancer, and he was about to die. Jerry Falwell, I believe James Kennedy, and a few other prominent, uh, the moral majority guys back in those days, they gathered around Francis Schaeffer's bed, and they prayed for healing for him, asking God, please heal Francis Schaeffer. He's too valuable to our culture at this time. Well, his cancer went into remission. And it was uh, considered a miraculous healing. But seven years later, he died of cancer. So it, Which the, even if he would have gotten 20 years, he's still going to die. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if, if he had been healed of cancer, yeah. he would have died of something. Yeah. But th th it was the Lord's timing. Yeah. So uh, w evangelicals believe in healing, but it's at the volition of God, sure. not the volition of a faith healer, and certainly not the volition of somebody who can crank up enough faith to believe it. It's for me as a believer to agree with you, we're going to lay this at the foot of God. God heal this person or deliver this person from a demon, whatever the request might be, but it, God must do it. Or else we're like the occult world who says there's, there's inherent power in prayer alone. There is no power in prayer. Prayer is simply the conduit of the power of God. Mm -hmm. God channels the power through prayer, but prayer itself isn't powerful or an unsaved person can do it. An unsaved person can chant for two hours and something's going to happen because prayer is powerful. 
Prayer is powerful only because wow. God is powerful and that's His prescription for sending that power. So if I believe by faith and I'm praying for your healing and God's will is to heal you, you will be healed. So miracles do happen, there are healings, but it's not at my volition to go around and hand it out like um, uh, gifts to people. That's, that's not the way I understand the scripture. Demons influence the mind. Somebody watching today, they sense that that's why they can't break through whatever's happening in their life. Right. And the only way to break through that is to turn to the Word of God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we are to transform our, our lives by the renewing of our mind. And it begins with giving our hearts and minds to the Lord Jesus Christ. If the devil is who he, the Bible says he is, a incredibly intelligent, powerful being who is also the father of lies, which means he's basically deceptive. And he hates God and hates Jesus and hates your soul to the point that the Bible portrays him as a roaring lion who seeks whom he can devour. He is not your friend. He is not going to present himself as your enemy and get you to respond to him. He's going to misrepresent himself. The only way for you to combat that subtle deceptive influence is through the knowledge and the truth and the accuracy of the Word of God. And I would encourage you to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Begin there. Understand, first of all, who Jesus is. He's the Lord of hosts, both the righteous host and the fallen hosts. Learn who Jesus is, and then ask Him to fill your heart and mind with His Spirit. And then the Bible tells us in Ephesians and Colossians to meditate, to let the Word of Christ dwell in our hearts that our minds and our thoughts might be governed by biblical truth and not um, subjective feelings and uh, um, non-permanent emotional well-being, but controlled by the Word of God. The Bible says that if we think on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we come before Him with prayer and thanksgiving, bringing our request before God, He will give us peace that passes understanding. Our peace is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in Him today. Trust in Him today. Get to know Him more by reading His Word. And that will drive you to prayer. That will drive you to humble dependence and faith in Jesus Christ and not in some supernatural manifestation or the power of some dynamic speaker. The power is always His. Amen. However He might demonstrate it, it's always the Lord Jesus. And He will save you and He can and will keep you. Trust the Lord. I know it's so easy. We all have that bent. Somehow we have a desire to somehow touch a man or an individual or even an author and think they have the answers. But folks, 73 years old, this is the answer. Spend as much time as you possibly can. You will get your answers here. God bless you. Bye-bye.